I'm Özlem Ishiten and welcome to our special edition of Showcase. Did you know that on average people drink about two, three cups of coffee a day? For some, that's just in the morning. No disputing it, we love our coffee. And soon, for four days in October, the Istanbul Coffee Festival will offer enthusiasts a chance to celebrate their favourite beverage. There's a whole coffee culture out there. And in the run-up to the festival, we have this special edition of Showcase that's all about coffee. Stavrola Logothesis discovers Istanbul's coffee culture. Coffee has been a big part of our lives since the 15th century. We all have our daily ritual, our favorite brand, and our favorite coffee house. But how much do we really know about this favorite beverage of ours? Did you know that if it wasn't for a shepherd more than a thousand years ago, the world might never have discovered coffee. Legend has it that this Ethiopian shepherd was out in the fields with his goats, who normally would just be hanging around and, well, doing what goats do, probably being lazy. But he noticed that after they ate these little red berries, they started dancing and, oh, prancing. So, he takes these red berries to his local Muslim holy man, who boils them into the first cup of coffee. But wait, there's more. He takes this freshly brewed beverage to his fellow monks, who drink it and realize that they can stay up all night praying. And the rest, as they say, is history. We've come a long way since those over-caffeinated goats. Here are seven things you may not know about coffee. Today, it's the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. Coffee is cultivated in more than 70 countries. Back in 1511, the governor of Mecca banned coffee, fearing all the discussions and debate generated in coffee houses. But what he should have been afraid of was the Sultan of Cairo, who stepped in, proclaimed the brew sacred, and had the governor executed. We now know coffee drinkers have a lower risk of Alzheimer's, diabetes, Parkinson's, and heart disease. And coffee stays warmer when you add cream. It's also sometimes pretty pricey. The world's most expensive coffee comes from Indonesia. It sells for more than $1,300 a kilogram, and it's, um, well, it's pooped out of an animal called a civet. And the world's first webcam was set up by scientists at Cambridge University to check if their office coffee pot was empty. Coffee house, coffee shop or cafe, regardless of what you call it, its primary purpose is to serve a good cup of joe. And if it can be done in a cool and cozy place, even better. These shops range from locally owned to large multinationals. And from a cultural perspective, they've always served as a place for people to come together.
When we think of coffee houses today, usually the first thing to pop into our heads is a place with big comfy chairs to lounge in while we sip an espresso or latte in the company of our friends. The smell of freshly brewed coffee hangs in the air and in the background, the sound of scorching steam frothing milk for that perfect cappuccino. Well, except for the frother, not too much of a difference from the first coffee houses back in 15th century Turkey. The first known public place to serve coffee was in Istanbul. It was called Kivahan. It served a strong, black, and unfiltered brew. People met up then, as they do now, for a cup of coffee and some stimulating conversation. Later, in 1647, the first European coffee house was established in Venice. Three years later, it caught on in England, and then, in 1683, Vienna got with the program. These cafes and coffee houses were artistic and intellectual centers, often visited by artists, writers, and socialites. Today, cafes are still places you go for conversation, but they've also evolved into something bigger. Some are art galleries. Or bookstores. while others are venues for poetry slams and even telecommuting. But for many, it's still all about the coffee. Is this your first cup of coffee of the day? Yes, it is. It is. How many do you usually get? Uh, oh, I'm a little afraid to admit it, but around uh, at least three, I think. Three a day? That's not bad. Most people have like 10 or, or 20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you go without a day without a cup of coffee? No. No? <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, no. I mean, even if I did, and I feel like something was wrong, uh, something was thinking, what, what happened today? Um, and and I, the new thing here, I've been here a month, so now I'm also into Turkish coffee. The rich Turkish coffee that they boil in the office, like, what is that? You know, can you make me a cup of that? And it's like, oh, it's really strong to begin with. And, um, but it's really good. When I was in Greece, I, uh, I had this kind of espresso machine, and I was like, okay, I have to have this when I get back home. I can't just live, life is too short for not drinking really good coffee. A love affair with coffee and that special attachment we have to our favorite coffee house can be traced back as far as the Ottomans. Joining me now in the studio is coffee expert Asli Aman to talk more about coffee. Hello and thank you for joining Hello. us. Hello, thank you. You're part of a new wave of coffee experts. Tell us what you do. What does that mean? Yes, actually I'm part of a, um, from a very old uh, culture, I can say, but today we are living the new uh, trends. Uh, as you know, uh, actually I was grown also like you uh, with the Turkish coffee culture and also instant coffee culture. Uh, but especially for the last uh, 10 years, uh, some things have changed in the world and also in Turkey as well. If we talk about in Turkey, about Turkey, uh, for the last two years uh, we see a dramatic change. Uh, every day, almost every day, a new coffee shop is opening, but uh, not all of them are serving the best quality of coffee, but they are trying to bring uh, the story of the coffee. So this is the best uh, way that we can reach all the information. And uh, in this world, uh, I have a 10 year experience of uh, coffee and I started as a roaster, roast master, and uh, I, I am also giving trainings in Turkey and also in some other neighborhood countries. And uh, also I'm representing uh, the specialty coffee. I, uh, I'm one of the ambassadors of specialty coffee in the world, which means that uh, you bring the artisan and the craft um, prepared, the beverages, and also the quality of the coffee, and you bring the story of that coffee to the consumers. So this is the most important part, and I think we will talk more about this today. 
Definitely, we'll talk about it. You mentioned Turkish coffee, and that definitely brings a lot of rituals with it uh, for making it and drinking it that's passed on from generations. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes, when I was a small kid, um, my family didn't let me to drink one sip of coffee because they, uh, I was told that I can become black. <laughs> Maybe oh. you know about this as well. And this is another uh, culture in Balkan countries as well. I heard uh, about this from my uh, friends from Balkan countries. Uh, but as I was grown up, I saw that uh, the ritual is becoming very interesting for me because, you know, we have this uh, marriage uh, ritual. Uh, the girl needs to represent uh, her um, beverage uh, quality and skills by preparing something very special for the group. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing. And the second one, actually, you can find Turkish coffee everywhere. It doesn't need to be a very luxury place or it doesn't need to be something very ordinary place, but you can find it everywhere in uh, all around the uh, country. But uh, the rituals are mostly prepared um, or done, not in a correct way. This is what we have learned from the specialty coffee as well. Uh, the beans that we are using or we can find in the country is not the per perfect beans. This is what we are trying to do, what we are trying to change uh, in the culture of the coffee. And uh, the next one, I can say that Turkish coffee has a very special way because uh, it is very strong uh, drink, but it has a very interesting uh, preparation because you unfilter the coffee. So it is interesting than the others. You don't filter the coffee. Uh, you just uh, use uh, something uh, which, which we call as jezwe or pot. But uh, the quality of the jezwe is very important as well. And the quality of the water is very important as well. So you need to uh, follow all the processes step by step. So I can take some tell mastering. these later. Yes. <laughs> yes. Any yes. Turkish person will tell you, take some mastering. So what are the differences between traditional European coffee houses and Turkish ones, would you say? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I can say that from the history, everything started uh, from the Arabian Peninsula, as you know. And then it came to the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire uh, land. But then uh, the European coffee houses brought the, uh, the right information to the consumers. And if you go to Europe, you can see that you can reach all the information about that coffee and you have the chance to talk a lot of uh, about that coffee with the barista. Barista mm -hmm. is the person who is preparing the coffee for you. Uh, when, when we come back uh, to Turkey, uh, actually it is a little bit different because our culture is mostly about the Turkish coffee and we have, if we look at the market uh, shares, the instant coffee has a big role as well. Uh, but nowadays, especially for the last two years, the coffee houses are changing. So you go to, you choose any of them and you go and then you can get any information about that coffee, the story, the farm. Uh, who is working in that uh, farm, how many uh, trees do they have, which trees did they pick the, coffee, the cherries from, and how did they process that, and how, did they, uh, how long it took for you to receive the coffee, and the other details. So this is changing, but at the moment we are very new, so this is what we can find mostly in the European coffee houses, and it is also uh, becoming another good culture, new culture for us as well. Well, so moving on to today, can you tell us about some of these new brewing techniques and the very fashionable cold brew? What is it? Yes, we have the brewing techniques like cold brew. Uh, we, we can say we have uh, main two types of it. First one is the Japanese style, uh, which we brew the coffee on ice. And uh, the next one is the Kyoto style, which uh, is generally called, the commonly called, is the cold brew. So you uh, grind the coffee is all, um, not coarser than French press grind level, and then uh, you let the coffee to sit under the ice and water mix, and it takes around uh, 8, 12 to 18 hours uh, for the coffee to be ready because it's, uh, prepared, it is prepared by drip. 
of uh, the coffee. And it is very concentrated. Uh, mm -hmm. So generally we serve this coffee together with the ice. We just put uh, some small amount of it and then we put ice and then we serve it and it's very, really nice uh, drink for uh, summer as well. But um, Japanese style is also something different. You change the recipe, for example, you put uh, less ice, uh, sorry, ice and less water and then you brew the coffee on the ice. So ice is under the coffee and you oh. again use hot water as well uh, for the certain amount for certain amount of temperature and then uh, it becomes more uh, fresh uh, and not that concentrated drink. And also we have the manual. Uh, we call them manual brewing or we call them as the pour overs like Chemix, Aeropress, V60 and some others as well. And uh, the best part of it is that you have all the control about the, uh, every part of the brew. You have control on temperature, you have control on turbulence, you have control on time and other things as well. Mm -hmm. So you don't need something electrical and it's different than a filter coffee, proper filter coffee machine, but it's another kind of filter, filter no coffee. No electrics, but it takes a long time. Yes, it tastes yes, good though. yes. So tell us about this first, second, third wave of coffee. What are they? Yes, actually, first wave, uh, first wave has started, uh, we can say, 1800s. And it was um, aiming just to give the coffee to the consumers. And uh, it was mostly about the marketing of it. And then, as you know, we uh, had the vacuum packaging and also mm -hmm. instant coffee, freeze-dried coffees, especially uh, World War One uh, brought the instant coffee choices. But in the second uh, wave, when we come to the uh, 1970s to 2000s, uh, very well-known coffee chains brought this uh, second wave. And this time, consumer wanted to receive more information about the coffee. They didn't uh, just meet uh, with the marketing side of it, but they wanted to receive more information. So it was a new wave of the first wave. Mm -hmm. But when we come after the 2000s, especially in 2002, a uh, very well-known uh, coffee company in uh, America, Wrecking uh, Ball Coffee Roasters, the owner of uh, this company uh, brought a new term. And uh, she says that we need to bring all the story about this coffee to the consumers and also right. the baristas. So now we have everything about the coffee. It's not only marketing or it's not only about just the story of it, but it's about every detail of the coffee. Um, but it's going again another uh, part, um, oh, like fourth wave. They say fourth wave, mm -hmm. uh, which means that um, actually these wave things are uh, something we can discuss more. But in fourth wave, they say that you can now produce your own coffee. If you are a barista, you can go to the farm, you can produce your coffee, and then you can prepare that coffee. Because the quality of coffee starts everything together with the green beans. Mm -hmm. Cultivation, green beans, roasting, and the beverage. So which is called the specialty coffee quality. Mm -hmm. Well, all that information makes me want to have a cup of coffee. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Case. Thank you. Barista is an Italian word meaning bartender. The best ones are highly skilled in making espresso, lattes, and cappuccinos. This is one of the oldest coffee houses in Istanbul, and this is its barista. According to UNESCO, Turkish coffee is an integral part of Turkey's cultural heritage. Turkish coffee is made with cold water from the refrigerator and drinking water, of course. When you cook it with cold water, the real taste of the coffee comes to the surface. The coffee is made in a copper chesve. Sometimes we might use a tin chesve, but steel chesves are unpopular because the effect they have on the taste. For the best results, we go with the copper one. Nothing can replace Turkish coffee. Of course, technology is evolving and there are new things. 
but some things are irreplaceable. Turkish coffee is a tradition that's part of our culture, dating back to the Ottomans. For us, it really occupies a special place above the rest. beautiful cup of coffee. Once again, proving that tradition never goes out of style. To your health. Coffee making has come a long way since the so-called Jezve, and traditional coffee houses have given way to boutique cafes specializing in signature drinks and ethical purchasing. The coffee shop owners like us, this boutique uh, and higher educated people is upon these kind of coffee shops and promote the uh, coffee like it's a specialty thing, not a, uh, a simple commodity. These coffee shops produce different cultures. They attract higher educated people to their establishments and this I don't want to say hipsters, but uh, this kind of people is begin to come to our places. Actually, the, the term for good coffee, uh, it's not depends on how is it expensive. Is too expensive coffees, maybe you don't like, but you can like more cheaper coffees uh, because uh, the taste is very sub uh, subjective. Uh, you like higher premium coffees, uh, maybe you like the lower premium coffees, it depends on taste. But the most important thing, how the coffee is grown and how it is roasted, because the roasting process is produced the flavors uh, for the customers and uh, finally, how it is served. Not only do the cafes come in a variety of sizes and designs, but the baristas who work in them have elevated coffee making into an art form. What makes a good barista is um, doing his or her job with love and um, having a good relationship and deep relationship with the guests, the customers, and uh, enjoy his job every second when he or she is doing. That's all I guess. What skills should a barista uh, has are uh, like multitasking, uh, doing uh, two or more things uh, at the uh, same time and also uh, okay, speed. When I'm uh, behind that machine, uh, it's like my daughter, you know. Yeah, it's always clean, always uh, works really well. When I'm behind, behind this bar, uh, I, see, I see myself on a stage and all, all spotlights on me. So I, I, pretend, I pretend like everyone is watching me. So. I, uh, that makes me uh, uh, excited and uh, this excitement gives me more energy and I, 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 just, I just try my best. So uh, it's like a live performance for me every coffee I make. We have two bars here, a brew bar and espresso bar. Uh, brew bar, we have uh, three different techniques here, Aeropress, Chemex and V60. Espresso bar is you know, uh, espresso is the uh, base of every coffee, so uh, I'm, I'm just able to do every kind of beverage here. I like cappuccino most. I think that uh, milk fits the coffee in uh, most in cappuccino, you know. Yeah, not flat white, not latte, but cappuccino is the best milk beverage I, uh, for me. In this culture, uh, there is no limit of learning, you know, because uh, every second there are new there will be new trends new new waves you know it's third wave right now but it, uh, then it will be fourth wave fifth wave the most important thing is aroma and uh, the least important thing is the cost of the coffee and with that we've come to the end of our showcase special on coffee but it wouldn't be complete without showing you some of the different coffee recipes you can make at home. Enjoy. I'm Özlem Şitan. See you next time for more arts and culture news.